loving Lord God in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that is ours this afternoon to come together in fellowship, in worship, focusing on a chapter that very, very few know anything about. But as you promised in Joel 2, 28 and 29, in the last days, you would inspire through your Holy Spirit the handmaidens, the women, as well as men, to preach and to do your gospel work. And so we focus on a few of them this afternoon. May their lives inspire us to do more for you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the tragedy of Nathan Fuller's apostasy shook the Advent cause on the southern tier. His separation from the church did not stall the evangelistic thrust of lay preachers and ministers. And all I'll say at this point about Nathan Fuller is that he was the president of the New York, Pennsylvania Conference. He was a leading evangelist in New York and Pennsylvania. He brought 300 individuals into the church, but he himself was kicked out of the church, charged with apostasy, deception, thefts, embezzlement, adulteries, incest, and abandonment of his family. If you want more information, I would suggest you go to Testimonies, Volume 2, where there are 50 pages on the terrible career of Nathan Fuller. Ellen White said of his case, my confidence in mankind has been terribly shaken. I believe that Nathan Fuller qualifies to be probably the number one rascal or rogue in our history. And there's very little inspiring about his story. But what follows is definitely inspiring. Although many of the articles and the letters printed in the review reveal the grief, shock, and anger which many believers felt concerning their former president's immorality and apostasy, Adventists everywhere knew that the message of the three angels must go forward. But who would carry the banner of Adventism on this rugged frontier? For over five years, no ordained minister was assigned to the southern tier. Finally, in August of 1874, James White suggested we have no better man than Dudley Kenwright to labor where general discouragement rests over certain fields. But, well, male church leaders were disposed to choose a man. God had already chosen a woman to bind up the old wounds and establish new churches in this bi-state area. And he'd been working through her life for 10 years. The licensed lay ministry of Sarah A. Halleck Lindsay has for a century and a half been obscured by the careers of pioneer men. But without the dedication and the sacrifices of unsung scores, of lay men and lay women like her, the truth would not have taken root and grown so rapidly as it did from the 1860s to 1900. And here she is, Sarah Ann Halleck. Named after her grandmother, was born in Ulysses, Pennsylvania on April 14, 1832, the first of three children reared by Noah and Hannah Halleck staunch Seventh-day Baptists. In 1851, when Sarah was 19, she attended Alfred College, a Seventh-day Baptist institution in Alfred, New York, where she studied the humanities for a year. That same year, Hiram Edson and John Andrews first introduced Seventh-day Adventism to Pennsylvania, but Sarah was unaware of their presence. Neither did she know that nine years before her birth, far to the north in Quebec, a boy called John Lindsay had been born, whose conversion to Adventism would unite his future with hers. Now, John Lindsay had been a Millerite. He had gone through the great disappointment of October 22, 1844, and shortly after 1846, he had been baptized by Joseph Bates. 
Around 1848, John married a woman named Esther. And in 1849, Esther gave birth to a daughter named Mary Ellen Lindsay. By 1850, at the age of 28, John began writing letters to the Review, telling about his witnessing endeavors. Since Quebec, as you know, is a bilingual area, John Lindsay may have had a speaking knowledge of French, a rare talent among early Advent workers. By 1852, he and Elder Alfred S. Hutchins were preaching in Vermont and other New England states. Two years later, however, John transferred his lay ministry to New York, where he teamed up with Charles Sperry for two years. But feeling the call of the West, John and Esther in 1856 moved to Waukon, Iowa. And soon thereafter, they moved to Ground, Ground Grove, Illinois. By 1859, they had also lived in Wisconsin and Minnesota. But sadly, in 1860, Esther died of tuberculosis, leaving John a widower with a 10-year-old daughter who needed a mother's love. So sometime around 1860, John moved back east to Ulysses, Pennsylvania, where he supported himself and his daughter Mary by selling watches while becoming active in lay witnessing. He also developed a romantic relationship with Sarah Halleck. On July 16, 1861, John, who was 40, married Sarah, who was 29. A year later, their daughter Catherine was born. Also in 1862, John wrote a letter to the Review inviting James and Ellen White to come and visit Ulysses. Members here, he added, are willing to be reproved and corrected, would gladly receive instruction. Five years earlier, in 1857, Elder Roswell F. Cottrell had pitched his tent in Ulysses. Following a two-week series of meetings, four converts received baptism, and one of the four was 25-year-old Sarah Halleck. Her letter to the church paper reflects the zeal of the new convert. I feel grateful to my kind, loving Savior, she wrote, that I have a faith and a hope that reach forward to a heaven that is, to a God that is, to a Savior that is about to appear the second time. Now, this positive conviction of a sin-pardoning Savior who is soon to come again never left Sarah the rest of her life. Throughout the coming years of the Civil War and apostasy and immorality of some in the church, her zeal to spread the gospel burned undimmed. Yet her service to the church began in a rather unorthodox manner with a theological inquiry to the review. I do believe, in fact, this is the first theological inquiry by a woman in the Advent Review. Her modest six-line insert, entitled A Query, addressed to Uriah Smith, the editor, stated that in the review of December 8 is an address to the female disciples in the third angel's message from a brother B.F. Robbins. Now, should it be a proper request, I would be happy if Brother B. or someone else would harmonize it with 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 and 35, and 1 Timothy 2, verse 11. Those of you who know your Bible know where she's going with this, right? This request, couched in respectful terms, contained a dynamic challenge to the brethren to enlarge the sphere of women within the church. The article to which Sarah referred had been written by B.F. Robbins of Friendship, New York. In this essay, entitled To the Female Disciples in the Third Angel's Message, Robbins had first questioned the heart consecration of many female members in the cause, and then sort of doubted that some of them had received the gift of the Holy Spirit to do their work in the church. 
And yet he also recognized that God, in Joel 2, verses 28 and 29, had promised power to both men and women in the last days. He also acknowledged the prejudice against women's active ministry in preaching. It did exist among Sabbatarian Adventists in some places. He claimed this was a legacy from the sectarian churches from which many had been cast out in 1844. Thus, some men had crushed out women's usefulness, he felt. Robbins then shifted his emphasis in the middle of his article. He encouraged and exhorted women to be more active laborers in the church. He cited several biblical examples to prove apostolic precedence for women's active roles in the early Christian church. Several women named Mary followed Christ and aided him in his ministry. Women participated in the day of Pentecost, and the Spirit descended on them also. And then he said their Spirit-baptized lips led them to prophesy. Robbins asserted that several women on the southern tier had been fellow laborers in spreading the gospel, encouraging men to greater endeavors for God. These women's gifts for the cause, he stressed, must never be despised or undervalued. He regretted, however, that in our social and religious interviews, women are so prone to inactivity and silence. Robbins concluded his article with a challenge to women. Be as consecrated and as faithful as the loving, blessed Mary's. Let the consecration to God of your all be entire. Rest not until your all is in sacrifice laid on the altar. Seek unweariedly the endowment of the promise of the Father, the power from on high, which is alike the privilege of both the male servants and the handmaidens of God. He said that if women would follow this counsel, the hallowed fire of the Holy Spirit would touch their lips, and they would become an abundant source of strength to the cause. Now, by citing those two texts of Paul regarding women's silent and subordinate role in the Corinthian church, Sarah Halleck, at 29, seemed to be urging church leaders to study the biblical role of women and then to reconcile that with Robin's positive approach to a wider sphere for women in lay preaching. Uriah Smith's reply revealed that John Andrews was already conducting an an investigation uh, with a group in Waukon, Iowa, into the role of women in the church. Now, three weeks later, B.F. Robbins also replied to Sarah's remarks. He asserted that the text that Sarah had mentioned could indeed be harmonized with his exhortation to women. If it was kept in mind that preaching the gospel was not usurping male authority. For it is evident, he added, that the gospel does not alter the relation of women in view of male priority. He went on to cite a rather long list of church fathers who had declared that Adam was superior to Eve because he had been created before she was. The fact that women were called by God to preach and teach did not lead them to usurp the authority of men. For in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul had admitted that women could prophesy, and in 1 Corinthians 14, he had encouraged them to teach and exhort in church. This, Robin suggested, harmonized perfectly with Joel's counsel that in the last days, women would indeed play prophetic roles. And so Robbins concluded his short article with an exhortation. Women who speak in assemblies for worship under the influence of the Holy Spirit assume in so doing no authority over others, but they are merely instruments through which divine instruction is communicated to others. When the Spirit descends upon women, he said, he will qualify the daughters of the Lord Almighty in these last days for abundant usefulness, if women would seek and attain the Spirit as he urged them to do, who, I asked, 
would forbid them to speak among their brethren as the Spirit gives them utterance. Now very soon, events would reveal how carefully Sarah Halleck had pondered Robin's reply. All around her, men were raising up new companies of believers. There was Nathan Fuller before his apostasy in Ulysses, Roswell Cottrell and W.S. Ingram among the Seneca Indians in Tonawanda, B.F. Robbins in Belmont, New York, and Niles Settlement, and John Barrows down in Texas, Pennsylvania. Why shouldn't she do something for the Advent cause? The successful efforts of the Ulysses Church in organizing itself and in promoting the organization of the New York and Pennsylvania Conference in 1862 inspired within Sarah a desire to enter the vanguard of this rising movement. On the other hand, the failures of some of the leading men sparked within her a desire to pick up the traces herself and pull the gospel wagon forward. In the fall of 1863, John and Sarah Lindsay began a series of meetings in Ulysses, Pennsylvania, attended by more than 80 believers, including three ordained ministers, J.N. Andrews, Nathan Fuller, and Charles Taylor. Perhaps these three ministers were sizing up this married ministerial couple, eager to include them in an expanded ministerial partnership. In October of 1866, Sarah wrote a short article entitled The Angel of the Church, containing four questions for James White or Uriah Smith to answer concerning Revelation 2 and 3. And once again, I must point out the in uniqueness of a woman in the 19th century writing a theological inquiry to the review. It just, it just didn't happen. Sarah's queries reveal her careful scholarly reading of the book of Revelation and her desire to understand its meaning more clearly. Her first question asks if there was not a distinction made between the angel of the church and then the church itself. Her second query inquired whether Revelation 1 did not make this distinction quite clear. In question 3, she noted, well, the angel of the church is addressed in the second person, I know thy works. The church itself receives exhortation in the third person, to him that overcometh. In her fourth query, Sarah pointed out this distinction was carried out through Revelation chapter 2 and 3 as well. Well, review editor Uriah Smith, and as you know, he is the authority on Daniel and Revelation. He actually replied to Sarah's four statements and affirmed that this is essentially the position taken by the General Conference Committee. So he validated her observation. He also agreed with her that the application of Revelation 3, chapter, uh, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, that application applied to Christ's soon second coming. And he lived in hopes that the church would soon see that fulfilled. This perceptive inquiry not only revealed Sarah's deep understanding of Scripture, but it also bore witness to her changed marital status. For the first time, she signed her name Sarah A. H. Lindsay. Now that signature, including the H of her maiden name, became over the next 30 years her familiar trademark, and that was unique. All the other women who wrote letters to the church paper used either their Christian names and married surnames, such as Ellen G. White, for example, or they used their married title with their first name or initials, such as Mrs. A. Jones or Sister W. Eggleston, but not Sarah. She never signed as Mrs. John Lindsay nor Sister Sarah Lindsay. Perhaps her independent spirit chafed at merging her identity too completely in that of her husband. And in that, she is unique. But the epidemics of diphtheria and typhoid that were raging across the New York-Pennsylvania frontier 
attacked this 37-year-old mother in 1867. Elder S.B. Whitney reported in June that for the whole month, Sarah has been extremely feeble, almost ready to drop into the grave, he said. Her poor health, he added, as well as the bad weather and the muddy roads had stunted the turnout to the evening meetings. If Sarah's illness kept her from the meetings and thus stunted their success, then her presence was somehow very important. Makes me wonder, was she already a lay preacher in 1867? Certainly, Elder Cottrell's announcement in July opened doors to a wider lay ministry in the conference. He declared that the demand for laborers in new fields and in places which promise the most good as missionary fields has induced your ministers to make this arrangement. No ministers henceforth would attend quarterly communion and testimony meetings. Why? There were just too few ministers to go around. And time is short, he said, and the last call is urgent. So he closed with the following challenge to the laity. The church is and always should be a missionary society. So he urged the members to make their meetings interesting while the ministers labored to preach to those outside the fold. And by the way, if you've ever wondered, what did Adventists call those who weren't Adventists in the 19th century? They called them strangers. Strangers. Not a very positive or flattering term. From about 1900 to 1950s, they were called outsiders. Some of you are old enough to remember that. And since the 1960s, they have been called non-Adventist. I'd like to see the day come when we refer to them as fellow Christians or something more positive. Let's see if the ministers and laity of the Michigan Conference can change that custom and give it a more positive uh, interpretation. This clarion call for greater lay involvement, coupled with the prostration of Elder Fuller, Andrews, Cottrell, and other leaders with typhoid fever, spurred the members to greater efforts. John Lindsay organized meetings for the fall of 1867 and cordially invited James and Ellen White to attend. By early 1868, prospects seemed much brighter for the little group in Ulysses. Although many Adventists had moved away to escape epidemics during the Civil War years, since the end of that war, others had moved into the area. Our prospects are brightening, Sarah wrote. Praise the good Lord. Her letter also reflected the personal trials through which she had passed over the past two years, a time, she said, of self-examination, self-abasement, much doubting, many fears, almost despair, amounting to semi-infidelity, as she witnessed the greed and adultery and apostasies of other laborers all around her. But fervent prayer and long conflict had rescued her from doubt. She praised God for her deliverance. Bless his name, she exclaimed. Why Jesus loves me, I cannot tell. I only know he does love me. At two weekend meetings in Roulette, Pennsylvania, Sarah spoke at the afternoon services on God's mercy and his justice, taking as her text Isaiah 3, verse 10. Say ye to the righteous, it shall be well with him. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him. At the close of her meetings, seven of the righteous were baptized, while Joel Sanderson, one of the wicked, was disfellowshipped. In her report, Sarah rejoiced that an insubordinate spirit was there bound in chains and that several backsliders returned to the fold. She felt that her meetings had witnessed the unmistakable presence of God. Consequently, as the cause on the southern tier was dogged by one apostasy and expulsion after another in the late 1860s, John and Sarah rose to the challenge and began a dynamic dual ministry. 
In January of 1869, they preached in Wellsville for a two-week series of meetings. And then they trudged on foot through 16-inch snowdrifts to Pleasant Valley, where Sarah preached 23 consecutive times. On the signs of the times, Christ's second coming, the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. This spectacular public itinerary was unrivaled by any other Adventist woman except for Ellen White. In May of that year, Sarah spoke six times at West Union. John, her husband, who reported the meetings to the Review, neglected to mention whether he actually preached or not. Consequently, when President Nathan Fuller's adultery and apostasy in the summer of 1869 shook the conference to its very foundations and nearly destroyed Ellen White's confidence in mankind, God had prepared a special woman to step into the breach and heal the spiritual and emotional wounds felt by many believers in New York and Pennsylvania. In a letter to the Review that fall entitled, Always on the Wrong Side, Sarah Lindsay compared Nathan Fuller, another immoral Adventist, to David in his sin with Bathsheba. Sometimes such bold sinners needed to be condemned as the prophet Nathan condemned David, and thereby forced to repent, for no sinner, she said, should be permitted to cover up his sins and bring such discredit to the cause of God. Well, before Nathan Fuller's fall, Sarah had assisted him and her husband and other preachers at quarterly meetings and weekend sessions. After 1869, her ministry blossomed into a truly outreach, evangelistic endeavor. At its annual session at Kirkville, New York, in 1869, the New York and Pennsylvania Conference acknowledged Sarah's divine call by granting her the first ministerial license granted to a woman in our church. With that license, she could hold evangelistic meetings, baptize new members, lead out in business meetings and other committee meetings. She was an honored Adventist woman. This unprecedented honor reflected, I think, the high esteem that the church held for her spiritual gifts. For the next decade, she and her husband, John, traveled all over western New York and northern Pennsylvania, preaching, teaching, giving Bible studies, and burying the saints as they died. In the winter of 1869 and 70, Sarah and John held meetings in at least seven towns in both states. They reported general discouragement facing them due to the severe trials through which our church has recently passed. Many believers had apparently followed Nathan Fuller out of the church. For the Lindsays wrote to the review, several were cut off and it will be necessary that others should be unless they come up to the work. The cause of God, she added, must no longer be burdened by those who have no heart in it. Both Sarah and John had a heart for the work, however, and they gave their best to the cause. During the summer of 1870, they preached widely among those Allegheny foothills. They waded through winter drifts to reach as far north as the Finger Lakes area. At the same time, they pleaded for a minister to come and organize churches and ordain elders and celebrate the ordinances among the widely scattered churches, many of whom had not observed communion for years. In the meantime, however, they prayed for God to give them patience to wait until these needs were met. In 1870, the New York Pennsylvania Conference delegates chose John and Sarah Lindsay as our official denominational representatives to the Seventh-day Baptist General Conference meeting in Alfred, New York, demonstrating the church's confidence in their leadership and diplomacy. Although prejudice and trials and backslidden Adventists faced them at almost every turn, they labored on 
untiringly. After their summer preaching tour of 1871, they could report greater interest among their Adventist Christian hearers, thanks to God's blessing in their ministry. They rejoiced also that they had found most Adventists strong in the truth. By the following fall, the Advent cause was definitely on the rise again, and the Lindsays reported a prospering spirit of God in several towns. On August 9, 1879, 1871, excuse me, the conference renewed Sarah's ministerial license again. You know, people showed such keen interest in her message, in fact, that in several meetings that fall of 1871, Sarah Lindsay successfully competed for public attention with a circus. When Sarah pitched her evangelistic tent in Beaver Dams, New York, on October 5, 1871, she competed for the public's attention with nothing less than Barnum and Bailey's Circus, the most famous circus in America. They had already dug in. They had already set up their tents at nearby Corning. Now, I don't know about you, but I think most Adventist ministers probably would have moved on to another town. Who wants to compete against Barnum and Bailey's circus? But Sarah did not move on. She bravely pitched her tent, commenced her meetings. And you know what? More people came to hear Sarah Lindsay preach then went to the three-ring Barnum and Bailey Circus that week. How do we know that? We know that because the postmaster at Beaver Dams, New York, sent a letter to the Advent Review praising her Christian ministry. And he added that she preached Bible truth and left a good impression on her hearers. What a spirit-blessed ministry. Further praise for Sarah and John's efforts flooded the church paper during the 1870s as their lay ministry revived the scattered churches. One attendee in Ulysses described their meetings as one of the most excellent that it has ever been our pleasure to enjoy. The conference acknowledged the value of the Lindsay's ministry at its 1872 session by renewing Sarah's ministerial license and granting John his first ministerial license. Together they held meetings in schools, churches, homes, or outdoors across a five-county area on the southern tier, using Beaver Dams, New York, as their primary base. In 1880, Sarah reported to the Review from Wellsville, New York, as a representative for the Pennsylvania Sabbath School Association. So she was, in effect, also a conference employed worker. Also in 1880, John Lindsay, now 59, asked for a change of assignment. He was getting old. He wanted to grow old gracefully. So at the next conference session, he received a call porter license. Well, Sarah, now 49, had her ministerial license renewed. From now on, she would preach the message of the three angels alone. Sadly, on October 11, 1881, John, suffering from cancer of the liver, passed to his rest at their home in Wellsville, New York. The church paper praised him as one of the pioneers of our cause, having been connected with the Advent movement of 1844. He has ever been faithful and true to the light he then received, it said. Despite the loss of her husband and longtime preaching partner, Sarah continued to spread the gospel message as before, although at a somewhat slower pace. The New York and Pennsylvania Conference continued to renew her ministerial license year after year, and she continued to preach and teach and bury the saints as they passed to their rest in the 1880s. In 1883, she shared a temperance lecture using colored charts in North Bingham, New York, which one observer described 
as very interesting and instructive. In 1895, Sarah's mother, Hannah Halleck, died at 82, leaving to Sarah the homestead on East Dyke Street in Wellsville, which still stands today. In 1896, Sarah gave what evangelist J.W. Raymond described as a decidedly refreshing testimony at his quarterly meeting. Three years later, she wrote the obituary in the review for Eliza Janung, an Adventist since 1856. Although it's possible that Sarah sort of semi-retired in the 1890s, she continued attending the church in Wellsville with 65 other fellow believers there. But in 1913, at age 81, she sold the family homestead to her daughter, Katie. So let us look at her face one last time. On a bitterly cold Tuesday morning. Gentlemen, it's time for the next slide, please. Thank you. December 29, 1914, Sarah Ann Halleck Lindsay, the first Seventh-day Adventist woman in America to be granted a ministerial license, passed to her rest in Wellsville at the age of 82. Her body, however, was taken to the Halleck family plot at Newfield, Pennsylvania, for burial in an unmarked grave. But angels know where she lies. And in the resurrection morning, Sarah will rise along with scores of her converts to meet her Lord and Savior in the sky. Now, although Sarah's pioneering ministry has largely been forgotten, in our church, her career as a female preacher was by no means atypical of the role of women in the 19th century Adventist church. And so in closing this afternoon, I want to very briefly acquaint you with the preaching careers of seven other Adventist women. Unfortunately, we do not have pictures for all of them. Angelina Lyon Cornell was the wife of evangelist Merritt E. Cornell here in Michigan a woman gifted with the command of languages. She frequently preached sermons at evangelistic meetings conducted by her husband. Often she followed up these meetings with Bible studies in the homes of interested persons. Her lay preaching ministry spanned the decades of the 1860s, 70s, and 80s in the Midwest and in the far Northwest. Ellen Lane was the wife of Albert Lane, our first Adventist evangelist, to enter the South. Shortly after the Civil War, the Lanes went to Tennessee in the 1870s and 1880s. Ellen, like Sarah Lindsay, had a ministerial license to preach. She often held temperance meetings as well. And in 1887 in Charlotte, Michigan, she raised over $100 for missions at one meeting. Now remember, you've got to multiply by 25 to get the equivalent values today. That's 2000 $500 at one meeting in our money today. Mrs. Burrell was also a licensed Michigan conference minister during the 1880s. As she traveled around the state conducting evangelistic meetings, she lived in a canvas tent and cooked her meals over kerosene stove. In 1880 and 1882, she held meetings at Charlotte and Bunker Hill. She also sometimes teamed up with James and Ellen White, for preaching efforts. One of Mrs. Burrell's contemporaries, Jenny Owen, also held a ministerial license from the Michigan Conference in the 1880s and 90s. Her meetings at Bunker Hill revived the waning faith of believers there. Her efforts at Eaton Rapids packed the local schoolhouse and brought revivals to Advent believers. Just weeks before she died of malaria in 1881, James White teamed up with Julia for an evangelistic series in Charlotte. One of our most outstanding women preachers was Lulu Russell Whiteman from the 1890s to World War I. She came from a family of eight children, three of whom became Adventist preachers. Two boys, one girl. Her older brother, Kit Carson Russell, served as a pastor as General Conference Religious Liberty Secretary, as President of the Eastern New York Conference, 
as president of the Western New York Conference for a total of 32 years of Adventist ministry. Her brother Edgar Torrey Russell served the church for 45 years as pastor and president of conferences in Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, South Dakota, and Minnesota, as well as president of the Central and Northern Unions. Lulu Russell, who married John Whiteman, became the most successful minister in the New York Conference between 1897 and 1908. She and her husband John labored along the southern tier where John and Sarah Lindsay had labored decades before. Her preaching and evangelistic talents received early recognition from Pastor S.M. Cobb. Pastor Cobb wrote to the New York Conference president, Albert E. Place, in 1897. She, referring to Lulu Whiteman, has accomplished more during the last two years than any other minister in the state of New York. I am in favor of giving a license to Sister Lulu Whiteman to preach. And if Brother Whiteman is a man of ability and works with his wife and promises to make a successful labor, I am in favor of giving him a license as well. The conference committee and the constituency agreed with Pastor Cobb. So in 1897, Lulu received a ministerial license six years before her husband received his ministerial license. Lulu specialized in what we now call dark county evangelism. She loved to go to those areas in the state where Adventists had never entered before. And then she would pitch her tent, she would hold evangelistic meetings, and she would raise up a new company or a new church. In fact, in 10 years, she raised up Adventist churches in 17 New York towns. The results of her ministry rank her not only as the most outstanding evangelist at the turn of the century, but among the most successful preachers ever in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In fact, at the 1901 New York Conference session, it was suggested that Lulu Whiteman be ordained to the gospel ministry. You may be interested to know that the New York Conference president, G.B. Thompson, favored ordaining her. The Atlantic Union Conference President R.A. Underwood also supported her ordination. But the General Conference President Arthur G. Daniels, who happened to be going through by train at that session, felt the time had not yet come for a woman to be ordained to the gospel ministry. So caught in a bureaucratic bind, the conference officials came up with a very unique compromise. I've never seen this anywhere else. They voted to give Lulu Whiteman the pay of an ordained minister, but the credentials of a licensed minister. Her husband, John, received only a nominal salary for assisting his wife. John was the one that usually led the song services, and Lulu did the preaching. In 1903, however, when the more traditional Sands Lane became conference president, some of the brethren foresaw a problem if the conference gave John a ministerial license. And so they urged Lulu to accept the lower salary of a licensed minister in order to avoid appearing to hold more authority than her husband. Takes us back to the, to the article of B.F. Robbins, doesn't it? John Whiteman objected strenuously to this treatment of his talented wife. Nonetheless, the conference cut Lulu's pay back to that of a licensed minister Many people agreed with John that it was terribly unfair for the brethren to treat such a talented woman in this matter. During the 1904 uh, year, the Whitemans led the New York Conference for the number of converts baptized, that is 27. Lulu had preached 147 sermons that year, and John had preached 140 sermons. In 1905, when the conference officials ordained John, he again pleaded, with President Sands Lane to ordain his talented evangelist wife, Lulu, but to no avail. Between 1897 and 1907, Lulu Whiteman had raised up a total of 12 churches in upstate New York. Five more churches arose from John and Lulu's joint ministry in the state. Not fully appreciated, I suppose, in New York, the Whitemans drifted westward to Kansas and Missouri, 
where Lulu's brother, Edgar Russell, was the Central Union Conference president. Here they labored between 1908 and 1910. Like her talented older brother, Kit Carson Russell, Lulu also engaged in religious liberty work. She became so eloquent in speaking in behalf of religious liberty that she was invited to address huge public crowds and even political gatherings, including speaking before state legislatures and once before the Congress of the United States. But in 1910, it appears that Lulu and John were influenced by Alonzo T. Jones and his anti-organization views, sadly. They opposed the reorganization changes that the General Conference was bringing about in the early 20th century. And as a result, they left the church. Tragically, their obituaries never appeared in the review to inform current and future generations of their many contributions. Shortly after 1910, Lulu and John retired to Los Angeles, California, where they lived during the 19-teens and 20s. Still another unsung heroine is Marinda de Sipe, known as Minnie Sipe. Before her conversion, she had been a school teacher in Iowa. After becoming an Adventist, she and her husband began holding evangelistic meetings in Oklahoma. Logan led the song service. Minnie did all the preaching. From 1901 to the 1906 year, the conference put Minnie on its payroll as a full-time evangelist with a tent and a ministerial license. She organized the JIP Oklahoma Adventist Church. In one of her series of meetings, 42 converts joined the church. In 1916, Minnie was chosen as the home missionary secretary for the Iowa Conference. For half a century, 1904, 1954, she served as evangelist, pastor, conference worker, and circulation manager for several of our church periodicals. Eventually, she went to the Bahamas as a missionary. Her last position, representing the Southern Publishing Association, took her to every single state in the United States. Jesse Weiss Curtis had been admitted to Battle Creek College at the age of 14. I, I don't know what you were doing at 14, but I was in seventh grade. A college student at 14. She entered to study nursing, but while she was there, she switched to Bible work and the ministerial course. Back in Pennsylvania, she began holding evangelistic meetings in the town of Drums in 1927. Her preaching led 80 converts to baptism. The conference soon hired her to train all of its male ministerial interns. Jessie specialized in using visual aids in her preaching. She had 42 huge bedsheets painted with the prophetic images of Daniel 2, 7, 8, 9, and some of them in Revelation as well. She also used stereopticon slides. Those were the huge, thick, glass-colored slides in her evangelistic meetings. Before converting to Seventh-day Adventism in 1896, Sarepta Miranda Irish Henry, her friends called her by her first three initials, Smy was a poet, a seminary graduate, a much-published author, and a mother of six who sadly witnessed three of her children die. As a nationally famous lecturer for the WCTU, she organized youth into cold water armies and loyal temperance legions in the 1870s and 80s. But following a stroke and a heart attack that paralyzed her left arm, she entered Battle Creek Sanitarium. And there she met Dr. Kellogg and his caring staff. We'll be talking more about Dr. Kellogg on Friday. When A.T. Jones and W.W. Prescott anointed and prayed over her, she experienced immediate healing. Ellen White urged her to continue her work for the WCTU and begin preaching on temperance and family life. 
within the Adventist church. In the late 1890s, Smy actually became the first woman's ministry director for the General Conference. Unfortunately, pneumonia cut her life short, and she died in 1900 at only 61. How many untold stories of other heroic Adventist women of faith lie buried today in attic diaries, closeted in boxes of letters, or molding in church record books. I hope that by sharing with you the amazing story of Sarah Lindsay and a few of her contemporary women preachers, that I have inspired you to go to your home church and look at those old, dusty church records and begin to reconstruct the stories of Adventist women in your area. Their dedication and talent have left us a legacy worth serious consideration as we seek to meet the evangelistic needs of the 21st century church and its mission to the world. Truly, truly, the prophecy of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, concerning women's preaching ministry and the Holy Spirit touching their tongues at the end time is being fulfilled and has been fulfilled in our church's history. Loving Lord in heaven, we thank you for the ministry of women in our church. You have indeed fulfilled Joel 2, 28 and 29 in so many ways. May we encourage the women among us to use their talents to serve God in whatever way he calls them to serve, that we may hasten your soon return and go to heaven where we can meet these remarkable 19th century women who laid a foundation for women's ministry in our church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.